So I just wanted to welcome everybody. My name is Craig Wiener, and this is the Transformational Dialogues. And um, you know what? What I love about these is there's a story every time, which is so perfect. And I didn't do that on purpose. It just happened that way. That I actually knew of Christina before I moved to Whibby, and I knew of her through her book, The Circle Way, because when I was in the Bay Area. I was part of so, uh, integrative health circles where we used circle where many different health practitioners would take a single patient that had been working with an issue for a long time and we sat in circle with them and one of the people in the circle said you have to read this book while we do these because this is exactly what we're talking about how to facilitate a circle so I, I loved it and then when I decided to move to Whitby she said you know she said you know that's where she lives <laughs> and I got like one of them. <laughs> Um, so, really wonderful to step into the circle that you created. And Christina travels around the world um, with Anne and peer spirit circles. She's an author, facilitator, mentor, consultant, what other words? Storyteller, story catcher, um, receiver, giver, all of those. And it really is just. You know, this isn't your first dialogue, but it's the first, just the yeah. two of us. Yeah. And it really, really is an honor to have you here tonight. Thank so thank you so much. So everybody, please welcome Christina Baldwin. So I want to thank you for hosting this, and I hope you get a lot of money in the treasure chest for all the stories that you're catching at Healing Circles Langley. And I want to thank my beloved Anne for being in this story together. Uh, because once upon a time, I was a journal writing teacher. And once upon a time, Anne was an outdoor educator. And when we met, we came to this intersection where we thought, she's working with burned out activists. And I'm working with self-actualized journal writers. How could we get them to cross the road and get the burned out ones to sit down and reconstitute themselves with some reflection and help the ones who had been journal writing all these years and were well reconstituted out in the road. And um, so we came together and we developed this circle process that has taken us around the world now for 22 years. So when we get the opportunity to be on Whidbey, which uh, varies year by year, we really like to look at how to use our work to sustain this community. And the foundation of everything that we do, everyone in this room, is story. Because we need story in order to bridge from one person to the next person. And one of the things that I notice out in the world so much is I get accustomed to walking around in this activated story field that we live on Whidbey, mm -hmm. where you think nothing of it in the middle of the grocery store, watching somebody fondle some odd shaped something or other and say, well, what is that? And then what do you do with kohlrabi? You know, and you not only get a recipe out of it, but you get the entire history of that person's relationship to vegetables. <laughs> right? And it, what happens is several things that I really want to emphasize tonight. One is that that kind of cross-fertilization of story creates a social safety net. Right? So that we move around in Whidbey, and we tend to stratify I, I, in Whidbey, and I think it's maybe because the ground we stand on is very stratified. You know, we talk of it as the rock, but it's not a rock. It's an old river delta from the glaciation period. And so first you get a line of mud, then you get a line of rock, then you get a line of sand, then you get some peat, then you get an old forest, and it all squishes down and it layers. And my experience on Whidbey is that we do a lot of layering and that what can help us jump out of our layer is story. So what I'm hoping to, that we play with tonight is just how to really 
take our own sense of social safety and bravery and interaction out on the streets around here and just amp it up a little. <laughs> and um, we're going to do this in such a way that both introverts and extroverts can play. Um, <clears throat> so I'll tell you a few stories about how I see this happen. I mean, we tell story all the time, and I'm just going to uh, completely avoid talking about social media and what's happening in social media, I think. I mean, it may come in, but that there's a huge story field in social media right now. And that's actually, I think, why we've developed the term Facebook Minute, is we go out for a tiny little bit of information and 35 stories later, we realize time has passed. <laughs> right? But the story field that most intrigues me is this one, eyeball to eyeball. And that has been the emphasis of the work that Ann and I do, is reminding people that we come from the campfire and the campfire is really our home. And I haven't noticed us going quite so far as to flick our bic in the middle of the vegetables at Payless, but we could get there. <laughs> <laughs> so what I mean about story jumping um, out of the strata is that when we're engaged in story, particularly with people that we aren't usually spending chosen social st time with, is it gives us a way of finding out who's there. Right? And in, in our human history, we have for years done what I call meet or meet. I'll just spell that both ways. All right? That if we don't meet each other, we turn each other into meat. Right? And that what prevents that and creates this social safety is story. Right? So, um, a little, I tell a couple of airport stories because we spend a lot of time in airports. But one of them that I love is about the time that I was lining up for uh, Southwest Airlines and um, there was a gorgeous, about seven foot tall, prone, young African American man who had his one foot in the A line but was sleeping on a row of benches nearby. <laughs> and you could see um, people that looked a little bit more like most of us in this room, kind of moving around this big guy. We're all going down to LA. And they say the A people can now line, you know, and he stretches and stands up and up and up and up. And there was like this little lady, I saw her like this, you know. And I just thought, I'm just going to play here. <laughs> Let's just play. It's the safest place in America, right? We have no, no guns, no knives. We'll just play. <laughs> so I went up to this young man. I happened to be standing nearby. And I just looked him up and down. He was total hip hop clothing. And I said, where did you get those pants? <laughs> now, only with gray hair can you ask yeah. that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I just said, boy, my son would just love those. And we got into this whole thing about where he shops in LA, et cetera. And pretty soon we're joking and laughing. And what's happened there is that we have knit, <coughs> knit the field through story and made each other not <coughs> threatening and created a sense of alignment. Mm -hmm. And so then I take this little lady, I kind of punch her on the arm, and I said, I bet you want some of that, too. Or, you know. <laughs> so you know, now I am that little old lady, so what can I say? <laughs> so I'm going to talk about story in four ways, which is why I brought this little sheet. That in order to play like that, we need to know our own story well enough that we feel confident in it. Mm -hmm. right? So that there's, the more you work with your own life story, whether you do it in journal writing or blogging or uh, meditating, however you do that, what happens is you create a very large sort of garden <coughs> of anecdotal material that you can share. And some of it's very tender. Some of it is, but it's all authentic. It can't just be, you know, mm -hmm. flipping through your card index of how to make them cry in 30 seconds. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's not authentic behavior. But what happens is you develop this authentic field of personal material so that 
you step out in confidence and if somebody kind of turns to you and says, well, who are you? You have something to say. Mm -hmm. And then you can say it and say, and who are you? Right. So story becomes this map maker. And it is the essential neurological differentiation of being human, as far as I can tell, which is that we are compelled to turn life experience into narrative, into story. And we're so compelled that if we don't know the facts about something, we just continue to make it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So that gets us into some trouble sometimes, actually because we jump to conclusion. Something happens we, and we fill in the blank. You see someone stumble on the curb. Oh, that drunk. Right? Unless your father was diabetic and you go, oh, oh, that diabetic. Or unless you have a cousin who's got cerebral palsy and you go, oh, cerebral palsy. Right? We fill it in with our own life experience. <coughs> But then we have to back up and go, but what's really happening? So it's like the first thing that we make a conclusion, then we have to open it back out and go, but what's the story here? How do I make a story that'll get me over there in a helpful way? So that's about map making. And then the second square here that's on the sheet is that how story is this path opener. That story invites us to imagine a new path forward. We have a lot of that kind of work going on on Whidbey. And uh, we have the new stories who are sitting here. Amidst all the old stories, we have our new stories. And that we can't step from current reality into future reality without crossing the bridge of story. That's how we get there. We can't, Jung said, proceed from the dream outward, but there are many variations of it. We proceed really from the story outward. We proceed what we can imagine. And this is really intense community invitational work because the mass media story of the future is not looking very good. And it's, it's like every single you know, dysto how do you say dystopian, dystopian. dystopian movie is like, let's amp it up worse. Let's make a worse vision of the future for young people to go and have dates and watch Mad Max Revisited because the first time it wasn't violent enough. So a lot of our work in community of all ages and I think particularly in a community like Woodby, which has a lot of gray hair in it, our job is to keep restoring the future in a way that is good, true, and beautiful so that young people have something to step into that is not apocalyptic. It's actually interesting because I think that most of the time story is thought of that which has already happened. Mm -hmm. At least for me. And so creating a story to step into, creating a new story, creating something consciously that hasn't existed yet other than science fiction, quote unquote, as a futuristic, is um, really beautiful and conscious and aware and, and creates a container for that. I like that and I think it's really important that young people have the freedom of a choice from the other media that they're hearing. So thank you. That's really good. And the, and the place they're going to hear that our story uh, is going to be a much quieter place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's also our job. And it's also really supported mm -hmm. by living on Whitby mm -hmm. and by being able to do things like take a child through the state park and talk about the age of the trees and talk about what is the story that that tree holds. How long has it been standing guard? How long do we want it to be there? How do we let it go if there's a storm? I mean, we can use all kinds of metaphors, mm -hmm. but we have to pull off of technology and turn off the television and the video equipment long enough for this other story to, to emerge. And time for it to be told. And time yeah. for it to be told. Well, now, look what our library is doing, having that quiet corner. 
You know, if you've been tracking that, they have this called the slow reading corner. <laughs> and no iPads, no Wi-Fi in that corner, and they're just helping people uh, just slow down and turn the page yourself. <laughs> and, you know, just to get back to touching books and having that imaginal kind of, of space together. Correct. So it really... But some of the questions, I just wanted you to have the questions that are in each of these boxes about, you know, um, the story as a path opener is really how it prepares us to take action in the world. And one of the questions I'm really thinking about right now, and I, I um, will probably get a chance to finish my blog on it in the next week or so, is how can we on Whidbey engage with some of the really desperate social questions that are out there. You know, and I'm particularly aware of the movement right now around, around Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And when we're in a fairly racially homogeneous setting, how do we participate with that? How do we engage with it? You know, how do we call out in ourselves stories that we just may not think to talk about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. stories from our past that we, you know, that we've experienced living other places. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to talk to kids. I mean, I think my my grade school photographs look a lot like South Whidbey photographs. You know. But that's not true for most of America right now, or large sections of it. So how do we really call out those stories? Ask people, you know. So here's our first bit of activism for the night. I would love to see us without starting a nonprofit. <laughs> without starting an organization, just in a little kind of guerrilla way, start posting story-inducing questions on the community boards around South Whitby. Right? Like, you know, those things that say lost dog and have your phone number mm -hmm. underneath, right? Well, let's just, let's just do, tell me a story. What's your first memory of X? Mm. Right? What was your favorite childhood birthday? I mean, um, what do you wish you, you know, if your dog could talk or your pet could talk, what it, would it say to you? I mean, it doesn't matter. We can start off kind of light and then we'll burrow down from time to time. Or when something happens in the news, mm -hmm. you know, that to come up with a question around it and just let's do it guerrilla. Let's just post it. Nobody goes out there and says, are you a nonprofit before you can put that on there. And do like with those and then do little tags with the question hanging so people can rip them off and take them home and say, look what I found in front of the drugstore. You know, let's, let's talk about this tonight. So I'll take that even further. I think we have more little mailbox libraries yes. than anywhere else. But I, th I don't see a lot of use, but what if there were like story boxes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That maybe you dropped one off and you took one. Or something that just encouraged <laughs> a little bit more play with that. So I like here's, that. here's another idea I came across that just stunned me the other day. It's called the Human Library. Have you heard of this movement? So look it up. Uh, just Google it when you get home. Not right now, Linnea. <laughs> <laughs> it's Human Library. And it's a fairly new movement. And it's starting, I think, outside the US and coming our way, which is really nice, instead of it being the other way around. But what you do is you go and you rent yourself out as a book, <laughs> as a living book. <laughs> and somebody can come and check you out for an hour somewhere in the library in a public wow. setting, in a well-lighted public setting. And um, people cool. are coached a little bit as to how to organize their life stories in such a way that they really can be engaged with an another person. And it's stranger to stranger. 
And some of the t-shirts I've seen on it say, what's your prejudice? Mm -hmm. And so it's breaking down racial, religious, sexual stereotypes, you know? Uh, and it's kind of one-on-one -on -one nice. proving all the things we know about the power of story. That if you know someone who is an X, Y, or Z, then you don't jump to conclusion and prejudice in the same way. All right. So I, I was very intrigued. They've got one up in Vancouver. You'll see it in just some interesting places in the world, you know. And some very hot spots like Belarus and other places where there's open, open cultural conflict. So, um, so those things are our community activism and path openers. And then the third box that's here is that says that story is a pattern keeper and a pattern breaker. And both of these are very needed in story. That first story I told you is a pattern breaker story. You know, to break somebody out of their little fear box and into engagement. Um, and a lot of that kind of story can also come into social play. And you can do this in a number of ways, pattern breaking. You can engage, you know, you can stop and engage with somebody. Or you can do what I call drive-by stories. <laughs> and just and drive-by stories tend to be like one sentence, two sentences long. And um, they just interrupt the pattern that was going on. So can you give an example? I'm, I'm just trying to think of one, but it's it's like um Stressed no. parent child in a store. Where you did know. you get those pants? Sounds yeah. like one. Yeah, where did you get those pants is one. But, you know, a stressed mother and child in a store. And oftentimes we don't know what to do. How could we break into that pattern? Mm. You know, and especially yeah, uh, you could say something directly to the child. You could say something directly to the parent. Like... Just, even if you just say, can I buy you a cup of coffee? You know, if somebody's screaming over here and you know there's coffee up at the front of the store, you just say to that mom, would you like a cup of coffee? <laughs> can I hold that? You know, I mean, and there's a friend of ours who's 85 and she says that her ministry now all occurs at this place called Coffee Talk in the town where she lives. And she goes and hangs out there two and three hours a day. And she just does this. You know, somebody comes in and they've got a toddler and a baby and she's 85 and there's a rocking chair in the corner and she says, would you like a five minute break? <laughs> <laughs> and she just takes those kids over to the rocking chair and she starts talking about when I was a little girl living on a farm. You know what a farm is? <laughs> Ever seen a cow? Now let's talk about cows. What do you know about cows? You know, she just goes right into that creating story field and the mother gets a five minute break. Okay? <laughs> you know? You know, so it's just these interceptions. Those are pattern breakers. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they take a lot of courage. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone is yelling about how they hate homosexuals, it's pretty brave to stand up and go, hello? You know? Can I buy you a cup of coffee? Yeah, can I buy you a cup of coffee? <laughs> yeah? Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> those are our three things that I like to play with. So I want to give us a chance to um, not just listen to me, but also to listen to yourself. Because I think once we start talking about <laughs> stories, your own story field gets activated. So I'm going to invite you to turn your sheet over to the star. And for those of you who don't have your glasses, I'm going to read it out loud. 
Um, this is a little design that Anne and I actually developed um, for this same friend who's now 85 and was overwhelmed at her kid's request that she write her life story. So I just said, well, let's just draw a star on the napkin and name five turning points in your life and start there. And it worked so well with her, I've just, we've discovered it works well all kinds of places. So. You can do this, one of the things I love about this is you can do it on your own life, which I'm going to encourage you to do tonight, but you can also do it on name five turning points in your organization, in your community, in your church, in your profession, in your artwork, in your life as a chiropractor, <laughs> you know, whatever you want to do. But let's focus in on what it says tonight is to choose five turning points in your life and development events that have shaped and influenced you over time. Okay, so you can do this short, you can do the last year of your life, or you can do a really long span. These may be viewed as positive or negative, events of nature or human cause and circumstance. They shape the narrative of who you are. Mm -hmm. They're part of that field that you draw from when you say, who am I? Okay? So I'm going to give you just a few minutes to, to identify five, and you get to do this as many times as you want, so it doesn't have to be right. <laughs> no, my pen is not where it's supposed to be. Is well, that pen? <laughs> you can borrow mine. Here you go. Go ahead and pause it. Yeah. Pen boxes back. Yes. So the second half of the turning point star is this little worksheet which is to help us understand how we take life events and turn them into stories. Okay. So I'm going to give you another few minutes and I'm going to invite you to choose one that you'd be willing to share with one other person in the room tonight. Okay, so just choose one that just feels like I could go there. And then on the worksheet to look at what is, the, what is that event and write it out maybe in just a few more words or a sentence than what you put on the other sheet. And what was the immediate impact? I mean, some of these events are a long time ago and you've never forgotten. Mm -hmm. So what was that impact that you noticed when it happened? And then tell yourself in a sentence or so, what is the meaning you've made of it now? Mm -hmm. so see that digesting thing that we do with stories. And then the last thing is the transforming possibility. Why is it still living in you? You had to choose five things. Why did this one come to the surface? Okay. Give you about four or five minutes to just go through that. Christina, for anybody online that mm -hmm. doesn't have the piece of paper and would like to be doing it with us, how would they get that? The quickest way is to email um, our office at cbaldwin at peerspirit.com, P-E-E-R spirit.com. Great. Thank you. And you about it? What's unfinished? Think of it at three in the morning. <laughs> so I'm going to shift us into incredible chaos here for a few minutes. So just some, anybody, and you may choose to do this with a stranger, if you can find one in the room. <laughs> <laughs> but we have some friends visiting from out of town, so I know there's at least two here. <laughs> so um, just sit, pair up, and I think... We're going to take this off tape so we can just kind of make a little mess, but lean in, pair up, lean in. Either next to, behind yeah, you. Yeah, wherever you find that person. Right. And take turns, and I'm going to give the, each partner... Wait, wait, wait! Not, wait. not yet. 
This is with the real I know, I know. Five minutes apiece, okay? So I'm going to ring the bell at the end of the first speaker's five minutes. And the job of the listener is to really just catch this story, all right? So we'll do five minutes, A talks to B. When I ring the bell, then I'm going to give you like three minutes to be really in dialogue and so that B gets to go, oh, I was so, you know. And then we'll switch roles, okay? Go, A's. <laughs> About about that. How was that? Wonderful. Yeah. Well, what was wonderful about it? What what really rang your chimes? I like the difference between the impact that something had and what the meaning you give it now. Because really, I thought about it. They they were different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's that it's that easy thing. To blend it all at once. It's all, It's easy to look back and remember it all. Remembering it. Uh, perhaps the meaning you give it now, right. rather than thinking, well, what was the impact of that? It's, it's, it was really fun. I liked that. It's hard to actually access the impact then, I think, because what we're living is the meaning making. Mm -hmm. no. Other observations? Yes, Nick? Well, I love the fact that uh, as the story evolved, it triggers so many more stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just to repeat, repeat back a little bit okay. for the camera. So what, what I heard you say was just how the bringing up of one story just begins to populate and bring forth all kinds of others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Alan. <laughs> when, um, when my partner started telling her story, my immediate reaction was, oh yeah, I had the same experience mm -hmm. with that. And, I didn't even think about that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I brought, actually, I went out in a fun little place today called Big Think. And I don't even know, you know, it's one of those rabbit holes. You don't know how you get down. But there's a quote of Jack Kerouac that relates to your thing about, about that, about, oh, I had the same thing. So uh, he's saying, I want to work in revelations. Not just spin silly tales for money. I want to fish as deep down as possible into my own subconscious in the belief that once that far down, everyone will understand because we are the same that far down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That far down. Yeah. Yeah. So. I think we're just going to be silly tales for money. Yeah. <laughs> Spoken as like a new have. author. <laughs> yes. I like how. Oh, no, go ahead. I, I like how some, some seemingly tired old story, you know, kind of dormant from the past, then telling it, bringing it out, and telling it, uh, awoke the energy in it again, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all that, um, and how um, it it really, and then it evoked a sense of gratefulness in me. I was like. And that, mm -hmm. that energy, that wave of energy still carries yeah. itself to the present day. Mm -hmm. yeah. that was, that was, uh, I'm, I'm appreciative. I think that's a really important point, Mark, about how the energy is reawakened in the telling because the mind and the body are linked, you know? So it's like it just the neurotransmitters around that story all get activated and goes into the heart. And so the heart really is activated again. I mean, it's oftentimes I can write something emotionally, and it's when I speak it mm -hmm. or read it that suddenly I cry or I mm -hmm. have some other kind of emotional release because it is an oral. I mean, we're wired for oral tradition. Mm -hmm. And so it, is all, it often takes me by surprise how much emotion comes up when... I'm both hearing myself tell the story, but I'm also in the gaze of my mm -hmm. story catcher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, hello now. Um, I've, I've sort of done the star, I think, many times, like the incidents or you mm -hmm. know, your river of life. And I was stumped at the lines at the bottom, like, how to tell the story. And I glanced over and I sneaked it. She was writing once upon a time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll start there. And I sort of once upon a time, there was a girl. 
And it com somehow, it just completely <laughs> came to life <laughs> in another way. And for some reason, I've never done it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I keep saying I want to write this story, but it just was so different to write it, in part because I think writing it from the third person um, shifted it mm. for me, because I, I went automatically to third person when I said once upon a time. Uh, but it got me very, very excited, because it immediately went archetypal. Um, so I was very happy about that. Yeah. Thank you. Sounds like a memoir teacher I know who <laughs> says that kind of thing. <laughs> Um, because I'm referring to myself in the third person <laughs> because that third person wakes up an intimacy that we, we sometimes even though we think oh it's so self-centered to say I I I you know but there's also a way that I becomes an unconscious recitation mm -hmm. but when we switch our own story into the third person it's like this yeah. And it, yeah, it yeah. really is amazing. The whole movie starts happening. Yeah, it was very amazing. I'm very excited about going home and keep going. So the other thing I want to amplify what Lone is saying about the once upon a time is that is a slight hypnotic induction in yes, English. Yes, it is. And it takes us into narrative. And so a lot of times now in business settings particularly will say tell us a story and they think it's the chronology well I founded this company five years ago and then I hired Fred and then this and I, that's not a story in the same way you know but if if we say once upon a time they go once upon a time I had a dream <laughs> you know and it instantly takes us into that realm so trust that and then when you're editing, you can just cross out the ones upon a time. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Another comment over yeah, here. In the back. Well, yes. I don't want to take you off track for what we're doing in relating to these stories, but can you give us a little uh, connection to how we carry this out into the world? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. Yes. I, um, I'm sorry, and Whitby, I have no problem with once upon a time I found a rutabaga. <laughs> <laughs> Kohlrabi. A Kohlrabi. A Kohlrabi. <laughs> In your story. In my story, it was a Kohlrabi. I think this is great family table. Mm -hmm. You can do this at family table. You can do it with elders or peers because I think over here um, Nick was saying how it woke up all the stories connected to that story. And so if you want to do some access of your own life review, just start at any one of these points get some pretty big paper because you're going to be amazed get some flip chart paper and just start then and then what are all the little stars that are connected to that point on the big star and it's a very helpful way that um, you can bring forward a collective project like let's say well I just you know this house has a story and it used to belong to a family down on the beach right Is Green Bank Farm Green Bank Farm. Okay, so there was a family that lived here, and, and you could do a whole project about what is our life on Whidbey? What are the summer beaches on Whidbey? Um, what do we know about our own genealogy? What do we want to say about sort of the parental generation forward? And just that you could do it as a five-pointed star. I don't know if you still have living parents or not, but you could just say, what do you think are the five major turning points in grandma and grandpa's life? You know, and, and then make it a project. Wouldn't it be interesting to see what a 10-year-old thinks are your turning points based on what stories you've told him mm -hmm. or her versus what you think yours are? Mm -hmm. You know, so to make it light and uh, it's a way that you can help people who've had more traumatic experiences. It'd mm -hmm. be great to use at the vet center, for example, in helping the veterans organize. You know, what are the turning points in your tours of duty that led you to where you are? And how can we help turn those another way if they're really traumatic moments? Thank you. Okay? And I do think the bus would be a great place. <laughs> <laughs> so... Next comment yeah. or question? Yeah. yeah. I found it interesting that the event I chose was one that sort of took me underground 
And it's like, I, it sort of then led me through my life to the points where it came back to the surface. Mm. And when it came back to the surface, it opened up. There was a lot of loss in that underground going into the ground, and it recovered pieces of it with a new orientation, with a new structure. And, and allowed things to enter my life that I don't think I would have ever welcomed or recognized right. before. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So you just did your own soul retrieval there in the second row in, in retrieving things from the underground right. of your own story. Yeah. Well, I was going to say that I think every time you tell a story, it transforms in a new way mm -hmm. each time. Mm -hmm. You know, it never comes out exactly the same. And sometimes it comes out in a certain way for a certain audience. Mm or it comes out a certain way for what the person you're talking to needs to hear, and you don't know why, but you both transform, you know what I mean? Right. It's like a, it, 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 it's a transforming experience each time it's told. If it's, if it's like what you said, it's a deep enough river where you're both kind of... So in thinking about how stories transform and how they come out slightly differently, both because of what you need tonight and what your listener needs tonight. And there is something so ancient about our turning to one another and having our hearts facing one another. And that, that subconscious material, it's like there's this place cooking between us that we don't know and as long as we feel safe, we'll just dive in. Go there. You know what that brought up for me, Catherine, is neurobiologically, we, we hold memories as if they're sacrosanct, never changing. Mm -hmm. And what we know is every time we revisit a memory, we change it slightly. Right. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. That's kind of yeah, the only way to keep it the same is basically to be in a coma and come out the other side when the memory hasn't been rethought of and reemerged and retouched. So, so it allow, understanding that, for me, really allows, well, what's true and what's not, and it's always through the lens of who I am now. Mm -hmm. So I get to change it, because I already am, how do I wish to, as well? And, and that allows, especially for a painful story, to emerge in a healing way over time, depending on how you tell it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. And this deep dive over here about, mm -hmm. I went into the underworld, mm -hmm. I went into a place, I mean, things happen to people that if you were standing at the door and said, we've got six disasters here, choose one, which one do you sign up for? None of us really remember <coughs> signing up for any of them. <laughs> when did I sign that card? And yet, as we come out the other side, they're incredible. They're gifts. Mm -hmm. right. They're really mm -hmm. gifts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, and in that old whole thing of meat and meat, mm -hmm. I mean, as we came to the fire at the end of the day, we always brought some M-E-A-T. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we always brought our story so that we could M-E-E-T. Mm -hmm. And that it, the story was more important than what you put in the fire to cook. Mm. No. Mm. Some days you only have the story. Some yeah. days you only have the story. Yeah, no need. Mm -hmm. So I want to um, reference just a few more of these big think quotes as we think about taking this out into community. One is um, Augusto Boal, the founder of Theater of the Oppressed. He says, I believe in democracy, but in real democracy, not a phony democracy in which just the powerful people speak. Mm -hmm. For me, in a democracy, everyone speaks. And one of the things that I keep thinking about on South Whidbey is how to unite our island. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm reminded uh, shortly after 9-11 there were some women who 
can't remember which nonprofit we were involved with at the time, but we were standing somewhere and we were talking about our absolute angst and anguish at what it appeared was going to be launched in our name as a result of that. So it was a very peacenik oriented conversation and um, up in Coopville and this young Navy guy about 19 tapped one of the women it wasn't me but a woman next to me just tapped her on the shoulder and tur she turned around he said I'm so scared Aww. and you know we just cut through the uniform and saw this 19 year old kid who signed up thinking this was the way out of some little town you know mm -hmm. and um, she just used the white hair advantage and wrapped him up in her arms and held him for a few minutes and then talked to him and we were we started having a conversation then about getting on the bus you know getting north south and mm -hmm. um, then Anne's and my career just like pulled us so far off this island and we've had to do a lot of that same kind of restorative work but we haven't done it here in our own community it's so much and it's one of our real draws now to stay home more in order to when you see something that's a need like that don't let it drop mm -hmm. you know how could how could we really weave more of this community and what's happening right now with the OLL, OLF field just kind of breaks my heart in terms of the polarization and the um, where can we have some conversations that really can cut through and help us see one another. So I want to close with a little story. Oh that some people who hang around me have heard me tell before because it's one of those tiny little moments in which the story door opens and I sometimes see when I'm walking around in a field of strangers like we're all walking around we have this tiny beautiful little door in front of our heart and you can tell whether that door is padlocked or just slightly closed or what would happen if you knocked on it but most of the time we don't knock we're busy we've got things in each hand and luggage and baggage and assumptions and all of that but Anne and I were in Chicago Airport on our way to <laughs> do some pretty deep communication work um, with a group of Catholic sisters and we staggered off the plane we immediately went to the women's room and you just you know this scene with this large mirror and all of the automated fountain faucets and soap dispensers and and all of us just whizzing around in there getting ready to go wherever we're going so I'm washing my hands and there's a very tired looking woman about my age, maybe a little younger, uh, next to me. And she's waving her hand back and forth in front of that faucet and she can't get it to work. <laughs> so our eyes meet in the mirror. And she says to me, I'm starting to feel invisible. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so I just reached out and I just touched her and I said, you are not invisible. Mm -hmm. And I put my hand under her faucet and held it still and the water started to run. And so the two of us end up washing our hands together in this flow. Mm -hmm. And she says, I just flew in from Istanbul I got to see my son for five days on R&R. &R. Now he's going back into the war. And I said, oh, that is so hard. And I said, would it be OK with you if I just said a little prayer for your son and all who are caught in that terrible situation? And she said, 
Yeah, that'd be good. What's his name? Jason, Mark. I don't remember the boy's name, but I remember her. And so we dry off our hands. She goes, thanks. All in the mirror. All in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And she heads over to the door and she looks back in the mirror and catches my eye one last time. And she goes, wow. (laughs) (laughs) We were like the women at the well. (laughs) Weren't we? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. We are the women at the well. Oh. And she disappeared. Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm-hmm. And then I raise my gaze and I see about seven women in tears <laughs> <laughs> who have held the space for that story. Mm-hmm. Okay? And that's what I want to leave you with tonight is when you knock on that door And you know, you have to do it. You don't do it in a dark alley. But when you are in a place that you know you can find in yourself just the little extra oomph that it takes to raise a question, to say hello, to knock on the door, to look in the eyes, that the field will be held for you so that the sacred can come in and story can do its work to create connection and healing. And that's our job. I'll see you in Palos in front of the kohlrabi.